Hello, hello. I hope everybody's doing well uh, in spite of the apocalypse. Uh, today we're going to be talking about how New York City sort of became this multicultural capital of finance, of culture, of, of so many things in the world. So the New York we know uh, was not always the New York that existed, obviously, right? The buildings and the grid plan and sort of the streets that we used to wander before we were all quarantined in our homes. Uh, that's a, that's a phenomenon that came uh, over time. Um, the New York that was encountered by Europeans back in the 1600s, 1609 is when Henry Hudson first sailed into New York Harbor and discovered sort of this fantastic um, this fantastic harbor, the finest harbor in the Atlantic Ocean, where you had wolves, you had black bears, you had mountain lions, uh, you had beavers. In the East River, there were whales and seals and sea turtles. Uh, there were also people living here, right? We had the Lene Lenape, who lived in the island of Manhattan, right, which has become obviously Manhattan. Uh, they had settlements in what is today Inwood. Uh, the Upper East Side, Chinatown, they had fishing camps along the cliffs of Washington Heights and the East River. In Brooklyn, you had other tribes like the Canarsie and the Rockaway. Yeah, so this was a very diverse place um, in terms of native population. So uh, the Dutch, they found this really sweet harbor. Uh, 1624, they set up their first settlement. From the beginning, enslaved peoples are central to the economy of New Amsterdam, and they would end up helping to build the wall that uh, would be torn down in 1689 and become Wall Street. Uh, they lived above this wall in many cases, serving as a buffer um, between the, the Dutch settlement and uh, the native populations who uh, were increasingly agitated by uh, sort of the violence perpetuated by the Europeans and the claims on land and property and title. We got to talk a little bit about like what the the Dutch and the Netherlands they were looking for in terms of this colony versus the British, the French and the Spanish. Uh, the Dutch were more looking for a fur trading post, right? They weren't like the people in Massachusetts who were like religious radicals who were like, we got to get out of England because they're not so religious anymore. Uh, they weren't like the people in Virginia where it's like, we got to get rid of all these natives because we're starting like a, a large planter settlement colony. It was, we're going to, we're going to trade with people. And, and from its foundations in, in a way, uh, New York is about making money, right? And so this will continue throughout the history of the island. So it becomes the center of the Dutch empire in uh, what is called the New World. I mean, it obviously wasn't new for Native Americans, but it is also sort of seen as a second-rate colony, right? It's not making as much money as some of these other colonies, maybe uh, in the West Indies, like Haiti, which is growing a ton of sugar at this point and making a lot of money. Um, even Virginia, which is growing tobacco and eventually cotton and making a lot of money. Uh, New York is uh, not seen on that scale. And... Uh, Eventually, you have a head of the colony, and his name is Peter Stuyvesant. Um, he was a religious radical. He um, really believed very firmly in the teachings of the Dutch church. Uh, he started putting in all these rules uh, that made it not so fun to live in New Amsterdam. But he also was kind of against integration and against different groups coming in. And um, in 1654, a, a group of Jews um, who were coming from what used to be a Dutch colony near Brazil and now had been conquered by the Portuguese and so no longer was a Dutch colony, uh, were searching for religious freedom. And uh, they landed in New York and Peter Stuyvesant was like, we got to get these guys out of here. Uh, we can't have Jews in this colony. Peter Stuyvesant was also the largest slave owner in the colony. And so this is the sort of guy we're dealing with. And so he writes the Dutch West India Company, who founded the colony in 1624, and he says, we got to get these Jews out of here. Uh, the Dutch West India Company uh, responds, as you can see here, uh, the conscience of men ought to be free and unshackled so long as they continue moderate, peaceable, inoffensive, and not hostile to government. Such have been the maxims of toleration by which this city has been governed, and the result has been that the oppressed and persecuted from every country have found among us an asylum from distress. Follow in the same steps and you should be blessed. So basically the Dutch East India Company here is saying, 
you know, we're good with anybody. So deal with the Jews, deal with and anybody being white people. But it, it, it is a marker of toleration in a moment, which is super intolerant. Uh, if Jews had gone to Massachusetts, they would have been persecuted. They, they were persecuting different types of Protestants in Massachusetts, right? Um, and so this is a big moment, and this sort of sets the framework for the city, uh, uh, which is sort of a, a city of inclusion, a city of multiculturalism. But New Netherlands and New Amsterdam, which is the, the center of New Netherlands, um, they have a fundamental problem, right? Uh, on their borders, on, on both sides, you have two bigger, more powerful English colonies. And eventually the English are going to want to unite their colonies in, in the Americas. And uh, this happens in 1664. Peter Stuyvesant is uh, surrounded by the British. They see this great harbor and they're like, you know, we want what the Dutch have. And so Peter Stuyvesant's like, we're going to fight to the death. We're going to kick out the British. And everybody's just like, yeah, you're kind of a jerk. Uh, we don't really want to do that with you. And so everybody surrenders to the British. Peter Stuyvesant is forced to accept this surrender and the British take over. Um, but the the sort of ethos, the soul of the city remains sort of this tolerant for white folk, right? Um, now, a lot of people, historians have said, you know, not much changes after the British takeover. Um, but that's not so true if you're, um, if you're an enslaved person or, or if you're a native, um, a lot's going to change. And uh, natives would be pushed from this land as the British form of colonization wasn't wasn't so keen in terms of um, keeping contact with natives and um, the English form of slavery also um, would have a dramatic impact. So 1664, you have the uh, Dutch get kicked out by the British, uh, Peter Stuyvesant said, um, but you know, you have this super diverse city where you have 18 different languages, for instance, in the 1640s, uh, wandering the streets of what is then New Amsterdam. And they're like, why do we care if we're ruled by the Dutch or the British? That doesn't really matter to us. This population is as long as the British are cool with sort of the, the rules of tolerance that the Dutch had invoked, um, we're good with this, right? And so uh, New York City becomes, and it will be changed from New Amsterdam to New York City. York is a city in uh, England. Uh, Amsterdam, obviously, is the capital of Holland or the Netherlands, uh, New York City will become the center in a lot of ways of uh, the the British Empire in uh, the Americas. Um, it will be the second largest city um, soon, in or the second largest port in the Americas, behind Philly, uh, and uh, the third largest port in all of the British Empire, which is like this massive empire. Um, London being the biggest, which is obviously the capital of England. Um, the British, uh, similar to the Dutch, but in, in different ways, uh, wage war against the native populations. Um, and they actually pursue sort of a policy of genocide or eradication of the native populations. Um, and there's a famous quote from uh, this period where a, a British person wrote, wherever the English have gone, the invisible hand of God has prepared a space for them by destroying and removing the native population, right? So they're looking at this situation where natives are dying of diseases, they're dying from warfare. The British also at this time are like playing uh, different native groups against each other, being like, hey, we'll hook you up, uh, you go after this group. Um, and uh, they're seeing like sort of the eradication of this population. Um, as God being like, I want the British to be here, I don't want the natives to be here, um, even without sort of like analyzing their own role in uh, this genocide. So under British rule, uh, New York City becomes sort of a center for trade throughout the New World. Um, and because it is the 17th century and 18th century, uh, key to this trade is slavery. Um, New York City would become the second largest slave city in uh, what will become the United States right behind Charleston, South Carolina. So I'm talking about a ton, a ton of slavery in New York City. By 1740, one and six New Yorkers was enslaved. Uh, so it's often something we associate with the South, something that we associate uh, not with New York, but New York uh, profited substantially and was built on slave labor in a lot of ways. Uh, between 1709 and 1711 at the foot of Wall Street, uh, which is uh, 
you know, today the, the economic capital of the world uh, was a slave market. And um, as the British Empire expanded and it is sort of trading all parts of the world and New York is becoming more and more the center of that trade, uh, slave labor uh, was required to sort of accommodate uh, all these fortunes being made. Um, but it, it's not like slaves here in, in New York were, were saying we should just lie down. Uh, there was there was a ton of resistance and uh, two very famous rebellions that we're going to talk about. Uh, in 1712, um, about 24 African-Americans, uh, including some African-American women, uh, they set fire to an outhouse in the middle of town. Uh, and when white folks came to put out the fire, they attacked them and killed them. Uh, they killed nine and wounded seven. Um, but obviously the white response was um, extraordinarily violent. Uh, 21 uh, people of African descent were executed, many of them being burned alive. In the 1740s, uh, another group of mysterious fires broke out and uh, kind of suspicion surrounding the African American as well as the Irish Catholic community. Both of these groups were, were seen suspiciously uh, because these are the two groups that were extraordinarily persecuted in New York society and um, and blacks were just sort of arrested at will. Um, uh, one person came forward, an indentured servant named Mary Burton, and she uh, took claims a hundred dollar reward um, and said there was a plot to overthrow the government uh, between freed blacks and slaves and, uh, and tied Irish Catholics to this conspiracy. Um, as racism went at this time, as racial fears went at this time, uh, white folks were really freaked out that um, black folks would rise up and try to overthrow them. And so uh, black New Yorkers were sort of rounded up and put on trial for their lives. Uh, 16 blacks ended up being hung as well as four whites. Um, 13 people of African descent were burned at the stake. And so when we talk about sort of the multicultural and, and the tolerance and the legacy of this city is just sort of a embracing many cultures. Um, we have to we have to put that within a, a framework where um, racial hierarchies certainly existed and racism certainly existed and played a significant role in the first, um, I mean, up to this day, but uh, certainly in the pre-revolutionary war period, it wouldn't be until um, after the Revolutionary War, that slavery would be made illegal in the city. So as a reward for getting through the lecture, Rosie, congratulate them for getting... Oh, no. Oh, no. History is so hard.